Hi everybody, my name is Bill L. Smith, and I'm pleased to welcome you to IS350 Sports and International Affairs. As a director of the Martin Institute and the Bora Foundation at the University of Idaho, and as a faculty member in the Program of International Studies in the School of Global Studies, I'm always interested in finding topics that are overarching in the sense that pretty much you can study all kinds of other topics underneath them, and or study every country in the world while you're studying that topic at the same time. And sports is a perfect avenue for that. Part of that reason is because of the rhythm of international sport, where you have uh, both domestic competition and club teams and stuff like that, individual athletes from a country, but you also have national team competitions and international competitions that bring athletes uh, together in ways in which appeal to home audiences and home governments in ways that are interesting and intriguing to me. This is not just a sports class. Uh, it's a sports and international affairs class, so we're going to really be looking at how these two things intersect. We will absolutely be looking at games and events and athletes and sports uh, and what they are and what their sort of context is in the world, but also then how those are applied and used by governments and intergovernmental organizations and non-governmental organizations and businesses and gamblers and, and politicians and managers and uh, all kinds of other folks to try and accomplish their aims. Because one of the things that you'll find through the course of this uh, semester is that as people pay attention to sport, they consume lots of other information and that there are topics and ideas that will raise to their consciousness because they're looking at them through the lens of sport that otherwise might not be. And so you can utilize sport as something that's popular, as something that appeals to a wide range of people and accomplish other aims. So for me, this is a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart and has been uh, for a long, long time. And I was supposed to go to this screen. There we go. That's much better. You don't need to see all of me. So why this class? Uh, and so why me? Why why am I the one who, who started this class? And I, I think it's because my earliest memories are of sports in the Cold War. So I grew up, I was born in the 60s, grew up in the 70s and 80s. And the Cold War was very much a dominant narrative uh, to me and my peer group. And uh, because I was a fan of sports, this got uh, sort of reinforced to me over time. If you don't know, the Cold War was uh, a geopolitical competition uh, between the United States and its allies and the Soviet Union and its allies that took place in all kinds of spheres around the world. So we're going to obviously sports is one of those spheres, but it didn't matter really where we got together. If it was political at the United Nations, uh, if it was uh, in, uh, in proxy wars around the world, if it was a medical convention or engineering convention or whatever it was, there was an attempt to show the value, the legitimacy, the validity of the political, economic, and societal uh, ideas that were embodied in the two different regimes. In other words, uh, the liberal democracy and capitalistic approach of the United States, of the uh, uh, communistic collectivist uh, um, ideology of the Soviet Union. And the question was, how do you prove you're the best uh, and pretty much any field was was fallow. They they could they could turn to it, uh, and in uh, sports was one of those very much so. So um, that's the image on the right is the Soviet flag and the U.S. flag. But the image on the left here is of a game called the Miracle on Ice that happened in 1980. That was really maybe the the dominant event of my of my childhood. Where um, in the Winter Olympics held in Lake Placid, New York, in 1980, the United States amateurs uh, um, uh, collegian a hockey team played the, the Red Army team, also technically amateurs, but of the Soviet Union, uh, by far the best hockey team in the world. And when we didn't particularly care much about hockey um, in, in Southern California, there were certainly pockets of the country that did care, um, but the NHL hadn't expanded. Um, there was a team in LA, but nowhere else in the South, uh, and the team in LA wasn't that popular. But the game itself came to resonate with all of us uh, and as silly as it may seem that the victory of our collegians over the Red Army team came to define us, uh, particularly at a period in history, uh, the late 70s, where the United States was pretty unsure of itself. We had some rough things happen to us. We'll look at this later in the semester. But this victory kind of grounded us and let us know that somehow we were doing things right. And so that's one of the genesis points of this class. I knew before, I knew after, but... The, the miracle on ice mattered to us and people in my generation in, in real interesting ways. Related to that in terms of the breadth of this course is sort of how I engage with sports then versus how I engage with it now. So one of the real interesting advantages that people have who are fans of, of niche sports, and soccer is no longer quite a niche sport in the United States, but it certainly was through most of my lifetime, 
I, I really couldn't consume soccer very often, even though that was my passion. And, and uh, I, I played in, in high school and I played uh, soccer and I, I wasn't from one of the ethnicities that typically played soccer in where I was from. So the question was if I was a, a fan of the commies, I was playing the commie sport because people who were Caucasian who played soccer uh, probably maybe uh, came from Eastern Europe or uh, someplace else. That was sort of the belief where I grew up. Um, and as a soccer fan, I would just so happy to meet other soccer fans that we couldn't really be rivals against one another. Uh, the way I engaged with, with global sport was through a television program called The Wide World of Sports. It was on ABC, uh, and it was on ABC for about 40 years, and it broadcast a wide range of events. So uh, one week you could engage with uh, bobsledding, and the next week you could watch uh, motorcycle racing, uh, and the next week it was horses uh, and dressage, and the next week it was shooting and rifles, and then track and field, and then soccer and rugby, and on and on. And so um, it, was, it was a breadth. And each time there was breadth, there was an introduction to the cultures and the peoples who were competing in that sport. It was a truly wide world of sport. And uh, that, that isn't the way it needs to be anymore. This, this image on the right shows just a few of the five way, of the very five of the very many ways I watch soccer this summer. I don't need to engage in a wide world of sport in the same way anymore uh, uh, outside the Olympics because uh, my passion in uh, in, in soccer can can be pursued to its fullest. It's uh, there's professional women's leagues and the, and the U.S. women's team playing in the Tokyo Olympics. I follow Major League Soccer very closely. Uh, I watch the Euro uh, 2020 here in 2021. Uh, the, the the Gold Cup, which is the championship of uh, North America, Central America, and the Caribbean. Uh, Copa America was this summer. There's been league cups. There's been early stages of the European Club Championship. There's just been soccer galore, uh, and it's been fantastic and fun for somebody like me who sort of waited their whole life to be able to uh, engage it. But it does mean that we've lost some of that breadth. And the breadth is very useful in a class like this. So whatever sport you play, whatever sport you follow, that's fantastic. And I hope you bring examples from what you like into this class. But be aware that there's lots more besides, and we should be able to look at that. This, this doesn't need to be a, a soccer class. Because, for example, early in the semester, we're going to look at what it means to be a Hawaiian surfer competing for the U.S. Olympic team, as happened here in Tokyo, which is a very peculiar thing because uh, you may not think of Hawaii as a separate nation, but there are Hawaiians, native Hawaiians, who invented surfing. And it's a very nationalistic uh, enterprise to be a surfer in Hawaii, but Hawaii isn't in the Olympics. So if you are a Hawaiian surfer who wants to go to the Olympics, you have to go as a member of the U.S. surfing team. And that's problematic and complicated and complex, just like a lot of other things are that we'll look at over the course of the semester. Now, not all the examples are, uh, are you know, from, from my uh, long ago times. Um, Ivory Coast is one of these things. There's a, a clip that I'm going to put a video a link right below this that if there's an event that shows what's possible with soccer, not always, but in the right situations, it's what transpired in regards to the Ivory Coast, the Ivorian Civil War of 2002-2007. So uh, on the right is a, a map of Ivory Coast that was a divided Ivory Coast. And on the left are two images, both of Didier Drogba, who was uh, um, an Ivorian footballer. He played in the United Kingdom. He played in the English Premier League. Uh, and who was a transcendent athlete, very famous. Uh, and there's some stories to tell about that jersey that he's wearing um, in unit two, uh, two seven. So um, the second unit, seventh topic, we'll look at jerseys and identity and, and why it matters, and why the this badge right here has a peculiar shape that is the same shape as this country here, this country outline. But they're in trouble uh, as a country in the Civil War. And they also happen to be on the cusp of qualifying for the World Cup for the first time, the 2006 World Cup held in Germany, and went through an amazing confluence of results and games. They did qualify, and the country was celebrating in their separate parts. Didier Drogba and his teammates took the microphone when the press was in the locker room after that final game as they were going to the World Cup, and they begged for peace. They got down on their knees and said, please forgive each other. Please, let's let's put this behind us. Please, let's have dialogue. Uh, and it transformed that moment built uh, into something real that actually leads to an end of the Civil War. And that later on, Drogba and the team um, take sort of the show on the road. Usually in a country like Ivory Coast, all home games for the national team are played in a home stadium in the capital city. 
And in this case, they said, no, we're going to go to this city in the rebel north that there was a Christian South and a, and a Muslim North and they didn't get along. And they said, we don't care. We're Christian players and we're Muslim players. We're on the same team. We're gonna use this sport to bring each other together. It's incredible. And this is from our recent past and we're gonna start exploring those things pretty early in the semester. So there's the genesis and the kind of thing we're gonna look at. And I hope you'll you'll watch this uh, this bonus bit here that's, that's listed here uh, uh, quickly. But let me, let me run through briefly what you're gonna see in the class. Uh, so, um, Keep in mind, it's a sports and international affairs class, not just sports. So the general questions are, are the things that I hope you'll take from this class and keep with you on into the future. So one of the advantages of this class compared to other things you might take is because of the rhythm of international sport and because of how often uh, sporting events sort of rise in the national consciousness, you should remember themes from this class for the rest of your life. And that's really not something I would expect in a lot of other content classes you might take in IS or in any other uh, part of the uh, of the university. Um, we're going to use specific examples to highlight these specific patterns. So, for example, there's a gentleman named Abebe Bikila who was uh, a marathoner who was from Ethiopia. And if you Google him, and I'll ask you to in the final exam, if you Google him and you look on Wikipedia or something, it will mention, or you find some clips on YouTube, if you don't find the right clip on YouTube, it'll talk about how he won the marathon uh, running barefoot. And okay, that's a cool image. It's an African man winning. Uh, an important race in the Olympics running barefoot. But that's the sports part of the class, the sports and international affairs part, where we're looking at how countries act and interact, what the main venues are where this takes place, how the sports space, that's a concept you learn in Unit 2, plays in. Abebe Vakil is from Ethiopia. Ethiopia had been conquered in World War II by Italy. The 1960 Olympics were hosted in Rome, capital of Italy. And one of the things that that the Rome, uh, the people in Rome were trying to do is show that they had rehabilitated from World War II. They weren't the same people. They were great, and they had a great history and a great future. So they planned for this signature event, the marathon, to happen, to run past uh, all these great ancient Italian architecture, past modern government buildings, ancient government buildings from old Roman times, uh, and to run into the Colosseum and to be this amazing moment. And the person who wins is a is a, a, a barefoot man from Ethiopia. Instead of showing the greatness of Italy, it shows the Ethiopians overcoming Italy. They're running past the great symbols of Italian history and heritage into their own stadium 15 years after they had kicked off the yoke of the Italians. It's an incredible moment, and it, it, it uh, propels Ethiopia forward uh, in real and interesting ways. So keep in mind, if you just come across something that says, oh, this, this woman was a great athlete, the question is going to be, so what for this class? Like, what else happened? And so, Abebe Bikile, hopefully you remember when you see that name on the thing. I heard about him way back when, uh, that there's more to the story. It's, a, it's an and international affairs part of the story. The approach, you're going to have uh, four units on patterns and specifics. Uh, you're going to have short lectures, 15 minutes like this one, a series of scholarly articles, but lots of stuff from Sports Illustrated and from other sports uh, journalism uh, outfits and some blogs. Gonna have these things called bonus bits that'll be short. A lot of times they'll have a lot of context, but you should have the context from the articles and from the short lectures. And there's a, a quartet of really excellent uh, documentaries that we'll ask you uh, to watch as well. Um, what this is the, this is boring. I'm sorry, but you know the, this is how it's going to be uh, graded. You're going to have the introductory activity. Each unit has an activity and assignment. Uh, each unit requires you to turn in, uh, in participatory notes that you've uh, watched the lectures, done the readings, watched the bonus bits. Well, the discussion and a couple of essays. There's also an oral midterm this semester that I don't have on here that you also participate in. The, the course space itself gets laid out like this. You'll have a unit per time within each of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the folders. You'll have um, the, the topics that open. It'll have the lecture at the top, the readings that you want to do, and the bonus bits you want to watch. Those you'll take notes on. Um, You'll see uh, at different points in there where in the in a spot there'll be the here there's this assignment. That's when you should do it, like after you've done these three topics, because I expect you to show you understood those when you uh, w when you uh, watch uh, this one. Um, I am going to be setting up for you an activity uh, to do um, that's going to be based on uh, on. Uh, on the medal table on countries that won the Olympics as, as part of an introductory activity. Look in the folder uh, for your uh, for your group. You'll find you've been assigned uh, to look at the medal tables and a particular athlete 
from 2012, 16, or 20 slash 21, and to tell us what they meant to their country when they won a medal. It'll be a fun start, and we'll actually uh, jump into all these sorts of things. I look forward to hearing from you.